Have the Father bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. Uh, may they be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name. Amen. So in the middle of that reading, here's the verses. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love it. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. Resolutions. Man, all you got to do is watch Facebook. Resolutions are worthless. Resolutions are a good idea. Look at it. Here's, here's the key. I, I, I read this about 12 years ago, and this is just a fact. Nothing will change in your life unless your dissatisfaction level for what's currently in existence is greater than the pain it's going to take to get out of it. One will not experience change in their life. They will not fulfill a resolution unless the pain of staying where you're at is greater than the pain of the work it's going to take to get there. Why do I bring that up? Well, it's New Year's Eve. And by the way, honey, Happy anniversary. I've made a lot of resolutions in my life. And I begin to realize that so many of them, I just, I just, it doesn't matter whether they're spiritual or whether they're physical, I just, the majority of them, I, they kind of dissolve somewhere in the end of January, early February. It could be because we live in Michigan and it's so darn cold out, but I'm not sure what it is. It just seems to wane. You've heard me say that, that we, we tend to live in groundhog's days. We, we tend to kind of live the same thing over and over and over again. We don't like that we're doing it. We don't like the way it looks. We don't like the way it tastes, smells, feels. But we just do it. We have no clue how to get out of the situation we're in. And this time of the year in particular, we have the ability to kind of do a little glance backwards, a little glance forward, and we get to, to look at our lives. And as Kimberly said, when she welcomed everyone here, some of us are coming in on cloud nine, man. 2017 has been an amazing year. For some of us, we're coming in crawling. <laughs> Hoping that uh, 12 midnight comes really quick and the new year, like, dings soon. You heard Stephanie say, and she's absolutely correct. Although we experience all those changes in our lives, the one thing that we have to realize that is God is faithful in all of them. He's faithful. So I want to talk about 2018 resolutions. But I want to talk about them in a way that they might become something that we actually fulfill. Not dream about, not think about, but actually do. So, I want to start with the incentive first. See, one of the things that Tom Donnelly has done in his mind is told myself that I can't have some of the food that I want unless I work out. And I've convinced myself that that's true. So every morning I get myself downstairs working out because I want to eat something. The reward system is a great way to create a resolution because it's tough to get through the pain of the change. But nobody knows this better than Paul, who wrote these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This was a guy who was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader. He was persecuting the church. And God completely changed his life. He did not just save his soul. He changed his life. He had to change some things up. People he once hated, he now had to love. Languages he maybe didn't know, he had to start learning. He began to work in such a way that everything changed. He says at the beginning of this reading, I determine, I resolve, I resolve to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He ends this reading by saying, we have the mind of Christ. Well, I don't know what 
what spiritual kind of resolutions you got going on, but one of the questions I'd like to ask you is, do you have the mind of Christ? Do you resolve to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Well, heck no, man. I go to church to meet Jesus on Sunday for an hour, and the rest of my life is mine, right? Paul didn't understand it that way. Paul understood the day that he met Jesus Christ that his old life was gone and a new life was beginning. He says, I forget what lies behind and I strain forward for what is ahead. It's all new. It's all new. So the question is, are we willing to break the habits of the repeating Groundhog's Day in order to have that all new? Are we so comfortable in the Groundhog's Day that we don't want to face the challenges or the pain that it's going to take to get where we want to be? So I want to say where we're going to want to be first. How about this? What if this is true? You like the what if? As I grab a Bible? No eye has seen and no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. God has prepared something for you. Do you know that? Do you live in it? Do you expect it? You looking for it when you go to work? You looking for it when you're at home with your, your wife or your spouse? You looking for it when you're with your friends? Are, are, are you... So look, what, what does he mean when he says, I resolve to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, and then him saying that we have the mind of Christ. Listen to me. I wear glasses because after eight years of college and all sorts of other things, I can't see. I can't see distance, and I can't see close. they got to do everything for me. But as soon as I put them on, things come into focus. Out of focus, in focus. You all look good, by the way. <laughs> Hear me out. What if all of us, most of us, are walking around as Christians with our glasses on? As I say often, we're trying to live in the kingdom of this world and sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on when he wants us to die to the old and rise to the new, just like Scout this morning. That one day, and then everything changed. One day I was this, the next day I'm this. One moment I'm this, the next day I'm this. When Paul talks about, I want you to think about this. Now listen to me. I want you to understand. I want you to see like there's a filter. There is a filter between you and the world out there. What Paul is saying is, I've learned to see the world out there through Jesus' eyes. I've learned to see the world out there through Jesus' eyes. And when the world looks at me, I make them see Jesus. See, the filter works both directions. When people see you, what do they see? Well, when you resolve to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, when you wake up in the morning with the mind of Christ, when you wake up changed, then all of a sudden there's going to be a radical difference in how you live. You can't live the old life anymore because there's something new you're being called to live to. What is that new? The plan He's created for you. How many of us aren't living out the plan that God's created for us because we're not living the way he's called us to live? Okay, now listen to me. How do you know how to live? Right? I, it, it, this, this chapter amazes me because he said God has revealed it to us by his spirit. Well, that makes sense. Jesus said to his disciples, go into the city and wait, because when the Spirit of God comes, he's going to guide you into all truths. When the Spirit of God comes, he's going to lead you. When the Spirit of God comes, he's going to remind you. When the Spirit of God comes, he's going to direct you. How many of you, including me, are being directed daily by the Holy Spirit? What if all of these things connect? So let me work backwards. 
If you or I are going to live out the plan that God has for us, we need to learn how to have the mind of Christ. In order to have the mind of Christ, we have to have a life connected to the Holy Spirit. Not just on Sunday morning, but all the time. we got to wake up like David and said, let the morning bring me news of your unfailing love. We've got to walk through our day, no matter what that day is, and we've got to see the world out there as Jesus would see it, and they've got, we've got to allow them to see us as representatives of Jesus. Well, how do we get there? He goes on to say that God has given us spiritual realities that you can only learn from spiritual words. He says the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him. He does not understand them because they're spiritually discerned. You and I need to be around God's Word. If there's going to be any change in our lives, we have to be around God's Word because the last I checked, God's Word is the only eternal thing that makes stuff happen. God speaks and there's suns and moons and stars. God speaks and water and earth are divided. God speaks and the earth melts. God's Word never comes back void or empty, but it always does its work. I mean, unless you're spiritually fasting, I'm assuming you all eat every day. How about God's Word every day? How about God's Word every day? What if Paul is right, or Peter is right, and the Word of God is nourishment to our souls? Like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk so that you might grow in respect to your salvation. What's the name of this ministry, by the way? Firmly Rooted. Funny name. What does it mean? Firmly root yourself in God's eternal truths. And if you and I firmly root ourselves in God's eternal truths, our tomorrow will be different than our today. Show me one person in the scriptures that ever got close to God and didn't have their life change. I can show you a lot of people who say they're close to God and their life hasn't ever changed. We are firmly rooted ministries because we believe that if we root ourselves into God's word, it's like nourishment to our inner soul. It is the spiritual word speaking spiritual wisdom to our transformed hearts and minds. Does that make sense? This is what Paul's saying. Once Jesus set me free and everything started to make sense, I understood how important the word of God was. And so I want to encourage you, from the folk, in 2018 to potentially resolve to be in God's Word for 365 days. Get up 15 minutes earlier. Sit down with your family. Come to a Bible study. I have them. We got Bible studies on Monday. We got Bible studies on Tuesday morning. We got men meeting, women meeting. Go, go look at the website. We got stuff going on almost every day of the week. Why is it always the same faces that are there? And listen, I'm not saying that you're, you're somehow less of something if you're not in my Bible study. Be in somebody's. But don't tell me that somehow you don't need it. Somehow you're the only Christian that doesn't need to be in the Word of God. I think Paul would rise up from the grave and tell you you're a liar. That no one can live without the Word of God. Because he who meditates upon the Word of the Lord is like a tree that's firmly rooted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. His leaves never wither and whatever he does he prospers. Anybody want that kind of 2018? Worship. Be in God's house. I know you're here today. Be here next Sunday. How about 52 of them?
See, one of the things about worship that I think we sometimes forget, and I'm just going to tell you flat out, one of the reasons why I love to worship is not just to praise God. I want to be around you. Life's hard sometimes. I like to be around fellow Christians who live a tough life and we kind of build each other up and we support one another and we hold each other up and, and we forgive what I mean, we got it. We live out. We live out in the flesh this thing we believe in our heads and our hearts. We live it out. It's so beautiful. Well, pastor, you know, I don't have to go to church and be saved. Well, yeah, I guess so. That's probably true. That's probably true. But what if God wanted you to go to church 50 times a year so that you might touch somebody else's life? It ain't about you. It's about the plan he has for you. See, Paul realized he had a plan. Changed his whole life. Going out and ministering to people that he hated. I mean, he would have never stepped foot in, foot in Thessalonica. Corinth. I mean, Corinth was like going to Los Angeles. San Francisco. It's crazy. And he went there boldly to claim the gospel because he wanted one more to be saved. Let's resolve. Let's resolve to see ourselves as Christ sees us. Listen to me now, everybody. Everybody listen to me. One of the worst things that happens today is we look back and we say to ourselves, you stink. As you're looking in the mirror. Not, you, not you, someone else. <laughs> we have a tendency to rip ourselves to pieces because the enemy whispers stuff in our ears about our reality. I want you to know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I want you to know that your name is written in the book of life. I want you to know that he says, Fear not, for I redeemed you. I called you by name. You're mine. I want you to know that you are a child of God. That you are set free. That you are born again and you are made new. That you are temples of the Holy Spirit. I need you to know who you are. And forgetting what lies behind you, strain forward for what is ahead. You strain forward for what is ahead, what God has called you to be. But you can't be what he's called you to be unless you're in a constant growth, that you're constantly moving into this new kingdom. My kingdom is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. We've got to learn how to grow up from a baby, just like Scout's going to have to grow up in the faith and grow up physically. We've got to learn that we're born again, babies. We've got to learn how to walk, talk, see, hear, think. We got to learn how to do all of that, and we do that together as we worship and as we are in the Word of God. It's that simple. So, what's the end? The end is you and I, some years in the future, will be able to look back and say, I fulfilled what God has called me to do. I knew what His purpose was for my life, and cha ching, I did it. What's the process in between? The process in between is to not live rooted in this world that will eat up all of your time, all of your energy. It will, it, will, it will suck life out of you. But you need to cut the roots in this kingdom and you need to re-root them in a new kingdom. And you need to start going to work from this kingdom. And you need to start going into your marriage relationships and your friend relationships in this kingdom. And you need to start seeing the world from this kingdom. And you need that world to see Jesus when they look at you. Amen. Now we become a rescue ship instead of a cruise ship. I'm tired of churches being cruise ships. Build bigger boats and these days smaller boats and, and, and but we gotta have great, great seating and great meals and we got, got all this kind of stuff that's kind of float out there. He, he's, he has sent us. Just as the Father sent me, so I send you. Not, not just me. You. My job is to teach and equip. You. Look at if I touch someone's life today, that's one. If 150 people touch a life today, that's 150 people. Multiply that out. So 
let me invite you. Let me invite you into a resolve. And I'm thinking that here soon there's going to be a sign on the, on the board in Oxford that's going to give people a, a, a challenge. I want to challenge people in the community to come to church for 90 days and tell me whether their life's not different after the 90 days. Now I'm going to challenge you who are in the church. Are you ready for your life to change? Are you done with the Groundhog's days? I'm challenging you. Be in the Word 365 days. There's this great pastor that does a daily devotion, puts it on his website. <laughs> Love that guy. <laughs> Sermons are on there. Bible studies are on there. So even if you can't come to a Bible study, you can listen to it. If you're a mom and dad and have kids, I'm going to challenge you to not make faith something that you just do individually, but you find a way to have faith expressed in family. Pull a Bible out and read a psalm with your children. Maybe talk about one of the verses and pray and be done. That's good. Just tell me after 90 days whether it makes a difference. I'm going to challenge some of you to come to my Bible study. I'm pretty good at it. God's gifted me to dig in. You want to know what the Bible says? You want to know how to understand the Bible? I can help you. All for the purpose that we can forget what lies behind and we can straighten forward from what is ahead. And what is ahead is that God's got a plan for you. And he reveals it through his Holy Spirit. So we've got to get around that Holy Spirit. And as we get around that Holy Spirit, He's going to start revealing some things in us and empowering some things in us and setting us free and making us new. And we're going to see some amazing things happen. I'm excited for 2018. I'm excited for all that God is going to do in my own life as well as in yours. Y'all good? All right. If... If, if the message, if the service has moved you in such a way that on this New Year's Eve, you're ready to let go of some stuff and start some new stuff, you're ready to live in this resolve, then I'm going to shut off my microphone and they're going to shut off my microphone and I'm going to come down here and pray with you. While Tim, Elder Tim, you coming up for the general prayers? So listen, Jesus says, come to me all who are weary, come. There's something significant for those who have gotten out of a blue chair and moved forward and said, I'm resolving. It's part of the resolve move. That you have the courage and the strength to face the past the pain of getting, walking up in front of people and getting before God and saying to God, I'm ready. Close your eyes. Get ready to pray. I'll meet you down there. Heavenly Father, with joy in our hearts that we gather here today, praising your eternal name. As this year comes to a close, we can reflect back as a church and see your greatness shown with love and mercy. We've seen people who were hurting but are now healed. We've seen relationships that were once broken and are now mended. Marriage is saved and prayers answered. You're truly our good, good Father. Due to your love and mercy, these things have unfolded as we reach out to you as individuals, as families, and of course as a congregation. Thank you, dear Lord, for being such a loving father of your children. And we praise your name as we saw that Kathy went through a successful retina surgery. For Shirley, who had a successful hip surgery. And of course for baby Lucy. Recent MRI and CT show that no evidence of disease anywhere. Thank you, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask for healing for Scott, who has a tear in his brain. Also for Jim, who's going through health issues. Please hold Emma Brown close to you, Lord, 
she has been hospitalized with a severe allergic reaction. And Heavenly Father, please work with Connie, Kelly, 